Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to Tree Church Bible Study. My name is Chris Reed, and I'm the director of biblical education here at the Tree and the host for this podcast. And really glad to be back with you as we continue in our study of the book of Jonah. Today, I am honored to be here with Pastor Michael Giacomoni. How are you doing today? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me. Good. And we're here with Mary Stalter as well. Yeah. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you guys back on the podcast. You're not first time, not first timers. So have we ever done it together? We have. One yeah. other time. So. I'm, so, I'm so glad you remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> it, made, it made a big impression on me. Yeah. yeah. If you don't know, they, they are siblings, so yeah. that uh, yeah. the, which always brings a fun dynamic to the, to the oh, podcast. It sure so. does. It sure For sure. Does. Yep. Nothing's off limits here. Nope. No. And, and no. hearing you guys' <laughs> stories is one of one of my favorite things in the world. So there are a lot you, of them. That's for sure. As you guys share stories, it's always fun. So, yeah. well, today we are going to kick off the Bible study with something a little bit different. So typically, I just ask you guys questions, and we just kind of discuss like some of your personal um, some of your personal thoughts and sure. and some of your likes and dislikes and favorites and things like that. Today, I'm going to read a couple random facts, and we're just going to talk about those facts. And okay. so we're going to get to know you a little bit through um, some weird statistics that, like that are it. out there. So um, I was doing some study on, <laughs> on this, and or I was looking up some fa- facts because I, I'm i just not knowledgeable in mm-hmm. weird random <laughs> things. But sure. um, So apparently, April 11th, 1954, was went on record as the most boring day in the world, which is, how, how do you figure that statistic out? That's wild. Right. Like is this a, is that a newly found statistic? Like did somebody like create a program that like surfs like like volume of news articles per day and that has uh, yeah. the least right. amount? Can yeah. you imagine? This is just something. If your birthday was April eleventh, nineteen fifty four, the most forgettable <laughs> day, the day the world you forgot were like, about. Nothing good happened. Nothing notable. You're no. like, oh, that's pretty funny. Wah, wah. But do you know what? But do you know, know what statistics are that a lot of people were born that day, yeah. right? Yeah. You know what's interesting? Um, that. By it having the least amount of like volume of things that happen that day, it, it becomes one of the more interesting days in human history. Yeah. So it is yeah. the most boring one in that, but in some ways it's not boring at all. That's super right. interesting that so and, little happened. And how nice if you being born that day is one of the most exciting things that happened that That's day. That's actually a really good point. Yeah. I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. Man, you spun that around so well. <laughs> yeah. Be so Just, nice. You were born up. on the most boring day of the boring day on earth. How and, special. Yeah. Right. How special how you sweet. are. Yeah. How great. So, yeah. So I think it is they... I'm sure they fed it through a computer program at some yeah. point. That's like, crazy, you know what man. I mean? Yeah. But just the, the the lack of significant events yeah. that happened on that day. But you know what's Pretty funny? Awesome. It's the most boring. That doesn't mean that nothing happened. So there's still right. yeah. stuff that happened stuff that went day. On. That that it, that's not that long ago that people might hear that and be like, oh, there's actually that not that boring. Right. Like something that really mattered something to me. Something that mattered yeah. to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me let me ask this question based on that that kind of statistic or that fun fact. Do you allow yourself or do you find yourself getting bored anymore? I remember when I was a kid, um, I would I would always I would always be saying, Man, I'm bored. I'm, I'm bored. bored. Yeah. yeah. I'm bored. I hear my kids say it every once in a while and I'm like, oh, man. not a chance. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you don't even come close to understanding right. boredom. Yeah. So do you still get bored at times? And if so, what do you what do you do when you get bored? That's such a good question. I think now I don't think I felt bored in a long time. Yeah. I can't even think of that. That's not true. I felt bored. Really? I agreed with you for a second. Here's the thing. I don't like downtime. I've like heard people say like as an adult, oh, I've got nothing going on this weekend. I've got nothing going on. And that's just so wonderful. I'm so excited. No, I'm still like I'm 13 and I will like Thursday night. I'm like, oh, I've got it. It's the weekend. And I'm like, I have nothing going on Friday. And then Friday, I'm like, dang it, I've got nothing going on. I'm like, I have nothing going on tomorrow either. Like, (laughs) no. And so I am a, I'm a plans girl. I love to be involved. You know what? I actually think I agree with you, but I usually don't let it get to the point of boredom. Of boredom. So yeah. if it's Friday, I did nothing and it was nice, and I've got nothing tomorrow. Right. I'm gonna like that's right. You're going to schedule out text. Yeah. I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing tomorrow? We vibing, we hang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what's the plan? But I agree with that. But that being said, I just think it's almost like a branding thing. Like when you're a kid, it's insufferable. Like I've got right. nothing to do. Like I, now, it's like there is a level of like, oh, I get to like now boredom is something right. to enjoy. Of like, no, it's restful, or I can just right play a video game or just like sit on my couch and watch a movie. Like now that's no longer bored. And that's like a nice, that's like rare, especially with kids. I got three kids that just take up such a high volume of time. So yeah, Yeah. I'm in a season of life where I have zero children and zero pets and just a husband. What's that like, man? It's a vibe. Hang out all the time. No, it's truly magnificent. I'll bet. It's a vibe. Yeah. 
I, I, it, it's been so long. Yeah. yeah. Since I, mean, I, I don't like, even know what that. Do you even yeah. speak on how much of a vibe this is? <laughs> Kyle and I have been talking about getting a fish for two years, but haven't <laughs> haven't pulled the trigger yet. It's too much of a commitment. It's too much of a commitment because we enjoy our time so much. I think about people like you fish. sometimes. I've got so I'm only thirty, which isn't super young, but I do have quite a few peers with no kids yet. And yeah. There's so many times I look at them like, "What do you do? Like, what, what do does you your do? life look yeah. like? Do you just hang out? Like, do you just like?" Look at each other and giggle all the time. Like, this is yeah. like what do you possibly do with your time? Like, this- my days are most like April eleventh, nineteen ninety four. Nothing oh. really going on. Not a whole lot of significance. No. Where now, my my days are just organized chaos. Yeah. Like you know, it's fun. It's just it's different. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find yourself in those moments like, man, I wish I was bored again? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had especially some, after. I wish kids. I had some time to be bored. Especially after kids, boredom is would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's a it's a luxury, and yeah, I'll tell you what. When I deleted social media off my phone, probably about, I want to say it's probably been eight or nine months ago. Nice. And you want to know when I know that I'm I've, I've hit the board space? I've pulled my phone out, yeah. and I just swipe between the pages of yes. apps. I don't yes. even click on no. anything. I don't have anything to go on. Mm-hmm. I just swipe between the pages because I'm so accustomed yep. to when I have a second that I'm bored, I pull that out and yeah. I look at it. Social there have media. been times when nine I've months ago out, and I still yeah. do it. There have been times I've pulled out my phone, clicked on Instagram, nothing good. Clicked off of Instagram, go to Facebook, nothing good. And then I re-click on Facebook, like something is gonna happen. <laughs> what like, happened in the last thirty yeah, seconds? Yeah, something's yeah. gonna entertain me, and I'm like, I was just here. There's nothing going on, and yeah. that yes, that is bored. <laughs> that is bored. My new favorite thing is Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. I've ne- I never tweet because nobody cares. But like, okay, constant, boomer. I oh, know. I feel so old. But constantly <laughs> looking at like just what's trending, like what's going yeah. on in the world. You know, I was up at two a.m. last night. I couldn't sleep. Like, the NBA trade deadline is today at like noon. Pe- middle of the night, people are getting set everywhere. Oh, I'm like, bet. I'm living it up. Like this is this is electric. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, <awesome. laughs> I love Twitter. I, I can't I can't do any of it. Look, <laughs> sure. I, I've tried Twitter. I've tried I've tried the, that's which is apparently now the old person. Um, I probably social media, and I can't even Mary, do it anymore. Mary works with the youth, so I guess she's the trustworthy one. <laughs> I and like it. I was a slow adopter to social media, and I was a quick exeter of social media. <laughs> <laughs> Last in, first out. Yeah. You know? So okay, so one more uh, quick, quick fun fact, and then uh, then we'll move on to the Bible study. The continental plates move at the same rate that fingernails grow. So that means the the Earth is it, That's it's such a crazy thought. The Earth is moving, so the tectonic plates they're they're running together and running apart at the same rate that your fingernails grow. Okay, so gross question. Sure. First of all, do you bite your fingernails? Yes. Yeah. Do you really? I do. You're a grown woman. Yeah. You don't bite your fingernails. I bite my fingernails. How long have you done that? Forever. Get out of here. I, I never can't. knew that about you. Yeah. Yeah. I bite them. I do you wash your hands before you do it? I, I wash my hands a lot. You do wash your hands a lot. But yeah. I don't specifically like, well, I'm gonna go have lunch. Like you have a borderline, like you have a borderline like O C D level obsession with, with cleanliness at times. Like you're yes. a very you're you're a pure L person. Yeah, very I'm one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Um, yeah. But I do unfortunately I don't know that I've ever bit a fingernail in my life. I do. If I'm it is a like I don't even realize I'm doing it, but like it's when I'm thinking. So like a lot of people do it. Like I don't even know I'm doing it. So you're not doing it for the function of cutting your fingernail shorter. No, it's like no, no, a, no, no, it's no. like a habitual while you're it thinking. It is a if I am deep in thought, I am squinting and like chewing on my thumbnail. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, me too. You do the same thing? Yeah. But uh, would you say the same thing? It's more for like a uh both. You do it for both if it's too long. So yeah. So Growing up, like I bit, I never used fingernail clippers because my fingernails were always bit off. At one point, I like, like as in, like as an adult, I stopped. Yeah. And I was able to quit it for a long time, and then you're back in the game. I'm back in the game. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I don't know why it started or yeah. what. Like, probably, I were, probably I were, when you went back to school. Yeah, I try not to do it any anymore, and so like I, I like, try to clip my fingernails. Have you seen those videos where like it shows you what is under your fingernails? Oh, like, yeah, bro. Those, nah, no, those no, listen, don't, no. that Chris is, like, is a fact <laughs> that I just pretend thing. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I, pretend I would I never, is I feel like I would do it bad. Like, if you, I, I've tried to use my other fingernails, to, like, if it's too long or whatever, but I feel like you always get, like, the that's top what, layer left, and it, like, yeah, yeah that's where I start. But you know what's nice and sharp? Don't ever do that again. Chompers. Oh dear lord! Let me tell you, you know what else is sharp? Fingernail clippers. They yeah. Are. You, my you first nerd. choice is my first choice is fingernail clippers. If it's been a minute, I'm like, 
Yeah. All right, I, I can't take place, that anymore. You know what I've done where I'll, I'll use my teeth is if I was using my fingernail to rip off my fingernail and then it does the hangnail, then I'll use my teeth to just like yeah. bite through it. Call yeah. it all day. right. So th- 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 that was m- grosser information than all of you needed to <laughs> yeah. know about us. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you see us doing that, don't shake just, our hands because yeah, our hands have been in our mouths. Or so. just come Slabbery. say, Mm-mm. Yeah, Mm-mm. yeah stop. say stop all doing right. that. Um, so apparently... The, the researchers think that if this continues to happen at one point in time, not, not you're biting your fingernails, but the continents keep growing together, this, the, mm-hmm. the continents grow, we're going to form another supercontinent wow. at some point. And so <gasps> what I really want to know right now is what would you name the new supercontinent if you had the, the ability to name it? You know, I think a nice name that no one's ever thought of would be mm-hmm. something like, like Pangea. No way. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Just something really unique, something that uh, something that no one's ever, <laughs> no one come, ever up with. come up with. Just you know, yeah, that's the what, what their theory yeah. of the original, yeah, yes. the original supercontinent would be called. Yeah, I don't even know how. Th- I'm just gonna call it land. Yeah, land. it's land. Earth and, yeah. You know, land going off the fingernail vibe, Manny. Manny? Huh? Like a manicure. Like a manicure. Oh, okay. <laughs> if it grow, if it moves at that length, you might as well double down. Might as well like, double yeah. down. Sure, I like it. I don't know what I'd call it, probably. Yeah. Probably Mike Town. Mike Town. <laughs> Stop. Like if you were in charge of this super continent, yeah. you're calling it yeah. Mike Town? <laughs> yeah. Do you know like uh, That's a big town, dude. Do you know like oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Mike City. Like, do you know like if you did develop like a uh, You gotta Mike, go with Mike Land or Mike something Land? like that? Yeah. Mike Land. Yeah. Mike Mike City. Mike's house. Mike's Mike's place. <laughs> Mike's place. I call it Mike's place because Mike's I think place. if if you like if you get to discover a new animal like you'll a lot of people name it after themselves right. you know what i mean like yeah i feel like if, if i get to be the person to name the new continent i'm not gonna not put my name in it you right. know what i mean yeah we'll call it mike's place call it mikey. <laughs> yeah mikey town oh i feel yeah. like this is going off the rails so fast <laughs> let's talk about the bible all right yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right so we're jumping back into uh jonah today and we're going to be picking up i i want to highlight verse or chapter one verse 17 it kind of it, it's a great transition verse because it kind of concludes the end of chapter one, but then it also sets up the context for chapter right. two. If you remember back in uh, chapter one last week when we were talking, and, and what we were looking at is this idea that Jonah was a prophet of God. He he's going out and he's called by God to go to the to the Ninevites and to um, proclaim a message of repent or. Um, destruction's coming, kind of calling them to repentance, calling them to um, to turn from their evil ways, their wicked ways. And so we talked about that. We talked about how Jonah really isn't even the main character of the, the book, mm-hmm. but that God is the main character. So it's the, the book is really telling of of God's character, God's love, God's patience, his his call to repentance and and his mercy and whatnot. And so we're really focusing on who God is in this story. Through the person of Jonah, through the fishermen, through the Ninevites, and, and kind of how this all plays out. So last week we left it with the um, with verse seventeen, and, and I'm just going to read it again to kind of kick us into where we're going to go today. Because today, um, a lot of scholars will say like, "Hey, this this is weird. Like the, the way this shows up is different." But um, what we're essentially going to get is a prayer or a psalm by by Jonah here that kind of describes his his process or his experience. As he was going down into the water, and as, mm-hmm. as he was um, as he was swallowed by the fish. So, this is what one seventeen says: And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So, God's way of saving Jonah was to have him swallowed up by a fish and efficient, uh, efficient, completely <laughs> That's efficient. How I do it. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. A, a raft or <laughs> yeah anything yeah, yeah like a log a log <laughs> a log <laughs> but um lesson lesson learned he's he's thrown into a fish and so today we're going to get Jonah's perspective while he was in the belly of the fish and um what's unique and what I would kind of want to start by talking about is Jonah writes this psalm or the author writes this psalm about Jonah and what's interesting is that if you look and you read it and, and you have some understanding of the other Psalms that are in the Hebrew Bible or in our Old Testament, you'll notice that a lot of what Jonah says is in other Psalms. Mm-hmm. So um, what, what Jonah is quoted as praying is found in Psalm 18.6, it's found in Psalm 31.6, Psalm 118.5, Psalm 120, verse 1. And, and so what this says to me is that as as this is recounted or as this is recorded, 
the author, Jonah's experience is filtered through his understanding of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So we see Jesus do it in the New Testament where he's on the cross and he's praying. What is he praying? He's praying the Psalms. He's praying the Old Testament. And so like it, their lives, and the idea is that their lives are saturated in Scripture and their lives are informed by Scripture, even to the place where when they're in distress, yeah. this, this is what kind of pours out of them. Now, what does it take to, I'll ask you guys this question, what do you think it takes to get to that place that this is what's pouring out of us when we're, when we're thinking, when we're praying, and can we still, can, do you think we can get to the place where that, that's a reality of our lives? Yeah, I think that's a super good question. <clears throat> For me, so like my start in the ministry and something that I still really am lucky enough to do is lead worship, and I realized I would hear so many great worship leaders lead worship and they would either pray something really beautiful or take a spontaneous moment in a song, mm -hmm. which is like just singing something new, just sing out whatever God's like putting on your heart. And I just so admired that. I'm like, how do they do that? Like, how do you, how do you think that quick? And I had somebody told me when I was in college, it's like, yeah, no one's just like doing that. It's because they were reading their Bible that morning. Yeah. It's like, because they're so deep in scripture that it's an outpouring of what's already be, like a mm -hmm. present truth that God's describing. And when they were practicing through that song, they were meditating on the scriptures that maybe inspired that song. Yeah. And the deeper you are in that, the natural those expressions, the more naturally those expressions come out. Mm -hmm. So for me, the way that looks in my life specifically is I'll do it through prayer and through worship leading, both of which usually when I'm out of like the things that I would normally do to connect to God. So if I'm praying and if I'm done praying, but I want to continue praying, praying a psalm, praying yeah. scripture is mm -hmm. or or and really focusing line by line of how that applies to my life. So I'll do it with the Lord's prayer all the time, or I'll, I'll pray it line by line. And it, I'll say a line and I'll mm -hmm. pray to God how this applies specifically to my life today. Then I'll pray the next line and then go into almost yeah. making it conversational yeah. through the delivery system, through that scripture. So I think, yes, it can absolutely, or, or, or music is that way. Like if I'm worship leading and singing something and if like, if something, you know, comes out or, or, or the Holy Spirit presents it to my heart and I feel like it, it's meant for that moment, whether it be through a prayer or through like a spontaneous moment, you don't have that if you're not in the Word of God. Like right. that's something I tell young worship leaders all the time. We were just telling, I was telling a youth kid this recently, where I was like, if you want to have stuff to say, read your Bible a bunch. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you'll have nothing to say. If you do, you'll have much. Like right. you, yeah. you will never have a shortage of things to say and pray and sing if you're in your Word. Um, so that's how practically I see that. At least you know, it's practical application mm -hmm. in my life. That might not apply to everybody, but you know, maybe the sure. prayer part will. Yeah, but I think it does. Like I think it does. I think it does apply to everyone. I, I just think it looks different for everyone. So like yeah. where where you connect through song and I, and I connect through music too. So sure. like when I see scripture sat like layered into a song, like that best. is just another That's way awesome. to to do it. As a matter of fact, like I've heard this story long long ago and th that all the old hymns that people think are these anointed songs or whatnot, that that is scripture laid on top of old bar songs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like 100%. they they would take the old pub songs and then they would to, they would take those tunes and then they would layer these theological scriptural ideas yeah. to teach people that couldn't read, that Absolutely. couldn't right. write how the scriptures. So to a tune be, they were probably already familiar right. with. Yeah, yeah. To, to a tune they were familiar with so that they could understand what God was saying to yeah. them. Oh, that's so, incredible. Um, Mary, you work with the junior high a lot. Mm -hmm. How how would you go about helping someone in junior high begin this process of of really filtering their life and saturating their life in in the word. In the word. Huge is stories. Like okay. biblical stories, biblical in even situations. Like something that when I teach on Sunday nights, if I don't, I'm always looking for like a biblical story to back up what we're talking about. Because like to talk about a concept of like the Bible can apply to this, like things in the Bible, these things can help you and can help, you know, guide you and help you connect to scripture. Mm -hmm. Like do it through stories. Talk about stories of like things that were happening in the Bible at that time or a character that was in this situation. And so for young minds, I find that like they are connecting to stories, to situations. And um, yeah, that helps them understand and connect. Yeah. So you would say like, so Jonah's go to in this situation is to pray one of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. You would tell a junior high kid, like when your life is tough, you can reflect on these biblical stories that yeah. hopefully you've retained because it's yeah. like much more like a pal, so they can reflect on those and think about those and yep. apply their life and, and mirror them and parallel them. Right. Like it's kind of a similar thing, but just a little different. That's still, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it it's the end goal of this is this is kind of what was highlighted. This is what the scripture is teaching in the story. Even the the story of Jonah. I talked with Pastor Phil last week, who was here. And he's he's like, this is one of the best one of the best books of the Bible to teach yeah. kids because 
there's so many moral principles. There's so mm-hmm. many good right. things to teach through. And he's like, the story of Jonah, them remembering that a big fish swallowed right. Jonah is a way for them to recall, 100%. bring back the mind. Like, yeah. oh, if I'm disobedient, like God has to oftentimes rest. God will resist me. God will rescue me. Like, mm-hmm. right. and, and I don't know that a th- three-year-old or a five-year-old is thinking to that right. le- level of it, but they, they remember. It their imagination. Yeah. 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 And they will. There are so many stories that I heard. Um, as a kid through, I, we grew up AG. So like in missionettes and in those places where like, I like remember hearing this story and where it didn't Mm -hmm. necessarily mean much to me then, but as an adult and as my mind like genuinely developed, I was like, okay, like Mm -hmm. these actually do apply and your mind expands, but I remember it from childhood. And so it sticks with you in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's huge. I also love how, um, the, kids ministry is having children memorize scripture. Yeah. Like that is huge. Having kids, one, they're sponges. The amount of things I've said around Darby that I don't even know, <laughs> Michael's my, daughter, yeah, my yes, daughter. Yeah. that I don't even know she's listening to or thinking, and she'll tell her mom later, Mary showed me this. And I'm like, did I? Like, <laughs> um, Did I show her that? But like genuinely, <sighs> they're soaking up so many things yeah. and they're going to remember that. So having kids come in and memorize these scripture and they're genuinely putting it in their brains and processing it in their heart to where they're going to remember that in years and sure. be able to apply it in mm. a more mature way. Yeah, I think as adults, we kind of we kind of seize up when we start to hear mm-hmm. that idea of we're going to memorize scripture, and 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 I love the I love the conversation we've had so far because I think what it does is, yes, you can memorize word for word, and you can get to the place where you are doing whether it be just one verse and you just yeah. keep re- reworking that verse, mm-hmm. or if you're just gathering the concepts of what you're reading in scripture. Right. I can think back on my life, like I've. I would say I'm not great at memorizing yeah, things. Me either. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like to, to memorize a verse word for word is tricky for me, and I've always struggled with that. But the idea of that verse generally comes back yeah. to me and sticks with me mm-hmm. later on. I mean, I can remember stories. like th- The most vivid one is a mission trip I was on where I was just like I was tired, I was exhausted, which typically happens on a mission right. trip. And, and I was just I was in a place where like I was in my head and I was I was frustrated and I was kind of just, I was just kind of done mm. with the week. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. I think everybody that goes on a mission trip knows that point. Right. Like you're just done. And and I had read something that morning. I didn't have it memorized, I re- but it's something I just encountered in scripture that morning. And later that afternoon, as I was complaining, yeah. doing the work that I was doing, it was like, that came back to my, it came back to my mind. The idea of that came back to my mind. And it was in that moment I was able to pray out of that, like, and and just encounter God with, with that situation. And so, yeah, for sure. And that's why having a high volume of that stuff really matters because life is up. Like as anybody listening to this can attest, life is really vast and at Mm -hmm. times really complicated. So like you're going to have an infinite amount of unique situations that happen, happen to you that are stressful, complicated, could lead you into sinful behavior, can make you angry, resentful. To have a high volume of scripture that maybe you don't have memorized, but you have conceptually an understanding right. of, yeah, you can reflect on that because that's that's what Jonah's doing. He's like he's looking at this moment where he's like, okay, I have, I have these things I can reflect on right now that bring right. me peace and comfort that point me yeah. to God rather than my own sin. Right. Huge. And if you don't know the yeah. word, it's gonna be really hard to have that in your life. And then yeah. you're kind of left to your own devices, which I can literally speak for myself, but for myself, not great. Like right. when I'm left yeah. to my own devices. Like that's just where I usually enter into sin, or I'll like find myself bitter and angry because I don't have anything else to focus on outside of like, oh, isn't that situation so ridiculous? 100%. And and so having that memorized is such a big deal. But luckily, fortunately for us, we're typically not in the belly of a whale and we do have access to the internet. And so even there have been times where I have been flooded with anxiety, like absolutely outside of anything I can rationalize or bring Mm -hmm. myself back from having a hard time like centering myself. Yeah. And look up Psalms for anxiety, like, yeah, and read good. them over yourself and mm-hmm. repeat them. And if you don't know how to pray or where to start or like where to come from, 100%. just speaking scripture in that way is powerful. Or speaking Pastor Chris's language, the power of liturgy of just like yes. declaring scripture and like speaking it over your life and yes. over your situation. And it, like, that's super good. Exactly. And that's what you think of. So I, I think in our context, we... We are not a, tr- to dip- a typically traditional like worship style. We don't have um, we don't have a same liturgy that we that we do every single week. Right. But to to the 
to the defense of the the traditions that do have liturgy, this is the reason for it. Right. It's it's so that it becomes so familiar that as you're walking through your everyday life, um, this is what's saturated in you. You know right. what I mean? You know where to turn. Unfortunately, I think it's been lost in translation in a lot of traditional churches. It was for me growing up in a Lutheran church. I, I didn't even understand what I was doing for right. 18 years of my life until I was old enough to to kind of put together yeah. what was happening. And it wasn't for the lack of trying from the pastor or whatnot, but it sure. was just like, it, I never put it together that, be, oh, this is what was yeah. happening. Might be I'm, reciting a translation that's difficult for you to understand. Right. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? It kind of makes it complicated, but the power of it is absolutely still there. 100%. So, well, let's actually jump into the psalm, and I'm going to read the whole thing today. So, and then we're just going to touch on some different points out of it. And it, I, I think this work, this flow will work best. And as you're listening to this psalm, I just want you to think about the whole idea of, of you ran away from God, you have been thrown into the sea, that you're sinking down into the bottom of the ocean, and this fish swallows you up. And so just I want you to have this mental imagination. How would you pray when <laughs> if this was you? You know what I mean? Like what would be the what would be going on in your head as as yeah. you process this? Yeah, like really put yourself in that first yeah. person person perspective of thinking you're about to drown. Yeah. Like, right. You know what I mean? Try to insert yourself and understand that you've abandoned God. Now you're gonna die. Yeah. And uh, like yeah, uh, super good. Yeah. So let, let's listen to Jonah's prayer here. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed over me. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought, me, brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and, I, my, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon dry land. And that is an image of images right there, is right. it not? So... A little confusing is the fact that it it's written in a way that seems like it's past tense, mm -hmm. but then it has it kind of flows back into the story. Right. So you get this perspective that Jonah recognized what was going on. He was sinking down. He was in a distressful moment. He was going to lose his life, and things were the, the the water was swirling around him. All these weeds were wrapping around him. I mean, for all intents and purposes, Jonah was resigned to his death at this right. point. You know what I mean? And in that moment, his first natural response was, God, save me. Yeah. God, rescue me. What do you think is, because we oftentimes encounter this as, as leaders at a church, um, we'll hear people tell us stories like, man, I was having the worst week ever, and all I knew to do was just to go, God, I need you. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what is it about distress and about stress and trials and in scary situations mm -hmm. that really drive us to um, to prayer and depend on yeah. God. I think that that's something that when you realize something is completely out of your control, you start looking for someone who can control it. Sure. Like, it is that recognition of I can no longer, there's literally nothing Jonah can do in that mm -hmm. moment. There's nothing that we can do when um, like people in distress, like when they get a negative health report, when they get um, realize that something totally outside of their control has happened it's like, okay, I no longer can do anything. So mm -hmm. at that point, I'm turning to someone who can or mm -hmm. maybe can or like... Well, hopefully. Hopefully can. Yeah. And so I think that that's where that comes from. And I think it's funny to say that the story of Jonah is so completely relatable because like to who? <laughs> like, <laughs> like in the in the sure. perspective of Swallowed Well, by in the details, yes. A whale, but, yeah. But yeah. in those, okay, I have turned away from God. I have, you know, disrespected him in this way. I know this about myself, but in this moment, like in my like desperate state, I'm finding my faith. I'm turning to God and it's like a desperate plea. Yeah. yeah I think that's just naturally like, that's a natural human response to, to stress. So yeah. like, this is a dumb example, but it's the first one that came into my head. I remember being a kid and like, like playing a video game and trying so hard to beat, beat a game. And me and Alex, uh, like producer Alex just literally talked about this yesterday where I don't remember what game he was talking about. 
But for me, I have such like a specific memory of playing Sonic 2 on Sega, and I couldn't beat it. Like I just, I spent probably six months, and finally I give the control over to my cousin Blake. I'm like, can you just do this? Like I want to see the ending of the game so bad. He's like, I can. You're not like you're gonna lose the satisfaction to yourself. And I was like, no, seriously. Like I'm at my wit's end. I can't. It's not within my control. Like it won't happen. Maybe for until I'm your age. Like I need you to do this. And they did it. It was great. Um, but that is like a silly example. But that's what he, you know, Alex had the same situation with his brother where he like, you know, had to beat a level four in a game. He's like, I just can't do it. There's something in organically human about being at your wit's end and mm-hmm. having right. access to someone who's not right. that you had like our default response is to ask for that help. Could be in a human situation, asking a parent, a friend, a pastor, right. but the end all be all is there's stuff that's just out of humans control. Right. And thank goodness we do have someone that overreaches our control. Right. That sure. is omnipowerful and omnipresent and has all of these incredible things that we just don't have. Right. So even moments of where, you know, it's your fault. That's all you have left. Right. <clears throat> and in Jonah's situation, more than more than most, that's all he that's has all at he that has. point. Yeah, yeah. he's it's literally dying. Yeah, right. absolutely. And so I don't have that in a life or death situation on a daily basis, but I know that feeling. Right. Like, this is out of my control. Like, yeah. I, just, I don't. It's God or nothing right now. Like, what do you? How is? How you know? The I think the powerful question is: Can we do that when we're not in life or death situations? Right. Well, that was going to be my next question. Sure. Oftentimes, you'll hear people kind of critique, like, "Yeah, people just reach out to God." Because you're in a tough yeah. situation, you're in a stressful moment, almost implying that like that is a bad response. Right. Like the best response, and, and it's probably a graduated response. You know what I mean? So sure. there, there's probably a, a graduated answer to this question. But is that reaction when we're in a stressful moment to cry out to God? Is that a bad response? Like is that yeah. something that we shouldn't do? No, I think it certainly is something we should do. I think the ideal is that shouldn't be the only time that you do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. If that's the only time you do it, I do think that you should take a hard look at your heart and that your response and why is it only in times of tragedy and distress and by reaching out to God. What that tells me is that there's a heart condition, there's a heart problem right. where mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you rely on yourself when you don't and you only go to God for this and you don't right. enjoy your relationship with him outside of need. And that's something that should probably change for a better quality of life and to glorify right. his name. There's like a ton of like hallmarks of problems if that's the only time that you reach out to God. So it's not that reaching out to God in times of trouble and tragedy right. are bad. And also it's not, it's not even quite as linear as like, like if you're in that spot, like I want to reach out to God, but I didn't reach out to him when times are good. So I'm right, not going to right. now. Yeah. No, always reach out to God as often as you think of it. Yeah. I think the prompt would be just try to do it more. Right. You know, not to like keep him so a part of your daily life that it's not like you're reaching out to him. There have been moments where I've prayed silly prayers like, Lord, I'm running late and I can't find my keys. Please yeah. help me find my keys in this yeah. moment. Yeah. Like keep him in the little things. And then in the big things, it's going to be so natural to sure. reach out to him that it's not like a Oh, I hate to ask, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm, right. Um, but in that, like Michael said, like, do. If you're not, if you haven't been, if you are in a moment of like, I've walked away from my faith, but now I'm in a crisis mode, let this be a moment where you come back to God. Let 100%. this be a moment where your faith that is written on your heart and that you've had in the past, where it comes back. But follow that. Keep that consistently yeah. after that. Like, like imagine if that was your, your relationship with your spouse. Right. Like, like the only time you talk to your spouse is in moments of like struggle. Right. Like, hey, we don't have money this month. Like, what are we going to do? You know what I mean? Like, oh my right. gosh, like how are we going to, you know, we don't have, gosh, our kid just, our kid just got expelled from school. Like, what are we right. going to do? Imagine, that's the only time you ever talk to your spouse yeah. when in times of trial. <laughs> right. You won't know how to talk to each other. Right. You won't be able to understand their tone. You won't be able right. to read them for nuances. You won't be able to like collaboratively work together because you just don't have relational equity with each other. Yeah. And also it'd be sad. Like, that'd be a bummer of a way to have a relationship <laughs> yeah. with somebody only founded yeah, on tragedy. Only, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No way, man. So like, it's the same thing with God. It's like, if you only recognize his voice in times of your struggle, right? your life is not going to be that good. Right. You know? And your relationship with him won't be good either. Yeah, totally. Exactly. And and what I find unique is that God's response in a moment like this. So mm-hmm. like, Jonah runs away. And Jonah, th- this whole like thing is about Jonah abandoning his faith. Right. He, he abandons God. He he flees what God has called him to. And, and isn't this, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but isn't this so like how it happens for us? We're going along in life and life is good. We're jiving. God asks us to do something and we're like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, yeah. And then we have a crisis of faith and we are like, yeah, right. I'm just going to just kind of walk away. And then yeah. all of a sudden. Remember that time? I'm sorry about that. By the way, <laughs> yeah. I need some help real yeah. quick. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And it, it, we hit that moment where we're like, where we finally break down the wall of like, right. God, I need you. And, and God's response in that is, 
I'm here. I'm yeah, here. I'm, I'm with you. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, it's unique. We see it in verse four, and this was kind of what he's talking about with um, going to God's temple. And so the idea of God's temple is God's presence. And, and so um, we could say, is he talking about the physical temple? Well, maybe, but he's, he's more referencing here. The temple was the place where heaven and earth met. It's yeah. the place yeah. where God's presence was known to dwell. And so it's, it's here in the belly of the fish that, that he cries out to, or even as he's sinking down towards death, he cries out to God, recognizing his ways have led him to a place where he would no longer yeah. be able to see and experience God's presence. Mm. Mm. But he cries out to God, and what God shows him is that his presence is with him right, right where he is. Right. So how does that encourage us? Mary, you kind of mentioned it already, the whole idea of, of taking... God into our everyday life, mm-hmm. how how does understanding and realizing that God is with us and goes with us and His presence is with us everywhere, how does that encourage prayer in your life? I think that seeing, like no matter what place you are right now, seeing that Jonah hadn't included God in his daily life, Jonah mm-hmm. hadn't like taken advantage of that, but God was still there. No matter where you're at in your life, God wants to be Mm -hmm. a part of your life. Mm -hmm. So don't let your insecurity or your shame get in the way of a relationship, the best relationship you will ever have in your life. Mm -hmm. So like, don't like allow yourself to get to a place where you're missing out on something because of your own head. Um, But have the knowledge that God wants you. God doesn't Mm -hmm. matter what you have going on. God wants to be in a relationship. He doesn't want perfection from you. He just wants your heart. And with that comes obedience and comes mm. having him a part of your life daily. Um, and your life will, you will have different reactions to things. You will realize that your heart changes with that daily relationship. But I would say, like, be confident in the fact that above everything else, God wants you. He wants your heart. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter where you're at in life in that moment. Yeah. And I think the Bible is like so rich with that kind of imagery. It's so, like this being one of them, like even in the stomach of a fish, God mm-hmm. still hears his prayer. I don't remember who the psalmist is, but like, it was one of my favorites. It's just like, even if I laid my head in Sheol, meaning yeah. like oh, the yeah. grave. Like, psalm 139. Yeah, Psalm 139. Like, you will find me there. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the, that's the, that, the loving pursuit of God that yeah. so far reaches how, where we place ourselves. Yeah. I like it, how that's phrased. Even if I lay my head yeah. like there, like I put myself even, even there. Even if I choose, even if yeah. I did this. Even if I choose the yeah. worst. Even if I Man, choose to good. do the same thing over and over and over again. Mm, um, yeah, there's a, there's a song I wrote some time ago that that's the whole point. That yeah. that even in my grave, you found me there. And there you you taught me how to be healthy. Right. Even when I was in the cold, you found me and you taught me how to be healthy. Just this idea of God's grand pursuit of yeah. us over and over and over again. And that's so, that's just the whole, that's such a heavy narrative in the Bible, yeah. you know, like, yeah. like, you know, whether it be the prodigal son or like, um, Hosea and Gomer is a wild example of that. We're finally at the end where, where Hosea marries this uh, prostitute Gomer and she leaves over and over again. And finally God's like, after she keeps leaving and selling herself in slavery, slavery, she does it again. And Hosea is like, I'm done. This is insane. And God says, go buy her back yep. again, because that's how much I love my people. Jeez. Like go do it again, because <laughs> this is how I view my people. That's yeah. so wild that whether you're in the stomach of a fish, whether you sell yourself into slavery over right. and over again, whether you ask for your inheritance early like the prodigal son and right. disrespect your father and leave and split and run out of money, wherever you are, God is still yeah. ready to listen to your prayer. Right. And in, in an everyday situation, it might not feel that dramatic. It yeah. might not feel like you're at your very end. But man, you're not going to convince me that having right. that access to God isn't going to make every single right. one of those situations better. Yeah. If it make if it brings us healing and health in the bad situations, it just makes the good stuff better too. Like right. having that relationship and that equity with God being with us, and specifically now we're talking about the temple being this place where heaven and earth meet. That's now us. You yeah, know what I mean. So knowing that we're temples of the Holy Spirit, to we are where heaven and earth meet. The Holy Spirit inside of us. To have that now and to have that access to God, right. it's like salt on food. Like it just makes stuff better. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, and to see it play out, and like I, I've I've. I've tried to, so uh, I think it's second, First Thessalonians 5 or Second Thessalonians. It, it, Paul says, pray without ceasing. And that this is the idea yeah, that, that that kind of means, is that as we're going about our day, um, as we're, and how it's kind of played out in my life is, whenever I find myself in need, I try to make that a moment of prayer. Right. Whenever yeah. I'm experiencing something good, I try to make that a moment of thankfulness and, and thanksgiving and, and just to say thank you. Bring God into each aspect of of what that is. The simplest things can be that, and the most profound things right. can be that. And it does. It, it brings God's presence into everything that we're doing. Right. 
Not that God can't go, okay, I need you to shape your day this way, Chris. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's not a God is just going to be an addition on top of my life, but it, it, it saturates our lives with God. And then from there, it shapes our day. It shapes yeah. our attitude. It shapes what we do, all, all the above. Super. I've always kind of viewed it as like a coffee filter almost. Like, like I'm sure you guys remember as married people, like like being in love and feeling mm-hmm. like there's almost this coffee filter in your life where everything that happens throughout your day, like, I wonder, I wonder what they would think yeah. about this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just this like sense of wonderment and awe of like who somebody is. Yeah. Like that to me is that praying without ceasing where I'm constantly, everything or like a Brita filter, like everything right. that's happening, everything that's passing through is filtered through this aspect of like, what does this mean to my relationship with God? Like, and then talking about it, like, oh, that's cool. God, thank you so much for that. You yeah. know what I mean? Or like, oh, I hate that. God help. You know, yeah. right. <laughs> just, to, just to constantly have this, like, yeah. it doesn't constantly mean your eyes are closed in this constant dialogue with God. It's right. filtering every aspect of life through, through because again, yeah. as we're seeing with Jonah, even in this very drastic moment, God's there every single time. So right. to not yeah. rely on that, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so this is a beautiful concept that God accept that God is right there with us, that God hears our prayers. There is a level of, of part of, of turning back to God when we've run away that involves a word that I don't think is very popular that we don't like very often because it, what it does is it recognizes that, Mm -hmm. Hey, we did something wrong and it's the idea of repentance. And, And what we see here is Jonah he, he recognizes the foolishness of worshiping vain idols, and he says that in verse 8. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. He wasn't worshiping vain idols, was he? No. 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 What was he doing? He was failing to worship yeah. the one yeah. true God. So, like, in that idea, he recognizes, okay, so for those that worship vain idols, the, there's foolishness in that. I recognize that. For those that avoid and, and, and uh, run away from worshiping the mm-hmm. one true God— I recognize even my complacency, my lack right. of action is an offense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is is an offense. So he recognizes that. And then he turns and he declares how he's going to act on his reinsured, his right. reassured faith, yeah. right? So there's this idea of repentance, of changing mind. Mm-hmm. Why is repentance kind of go part and parcel with the right. idea of of turning your thoughts and your mind and your heart back to God? The the prayer of faith, God saving is the the good part. <laughs> I would say what we would consider the positive right. part, yeah. the idea of admitting that we're wrong, that we need to, and, and we even need to recognize we need to go a different direction yeah. than the way that we were going. Yeah. Why is that the hard part for us? Yeah. Well, I think that like the first part doesn't matter without the second part right. because it shows that the first part was for lip service only. So right. the idea of yeah. like, like, okay, we're talking, you know, I've used marriage as an example a couple times now, but like. Like if I say something disrespectful and then I apologize for it, and then the second I'm done apologizing for it, I say the same thing. Like what I said, sorry. It's like when you are, <laughs> yeah, you are right? yeah. yeah. Like where are you sorry? You know what right. I mean? Like, like there, there's our actions indicate how we feel, what right. we believe. Um, I mean, it's like the it, sometimes cliches can be like feel so basic to use, but the reality is like actions speak louder than words. Yeah, there's a reason why that's a cliche. Yeah, it's profoundly true. Right. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Like talk is cheap. That's the cliche. easy part. The easy part is saying yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are you actually going to show that you're sorry right. by changing the way that you behave? Sure. And if you just do one without the other, you know what I mean? Like, I guess you can just change the way you behave. But even that, without acknowledging the brokenness, right. you're still leaving a wake of hurt in your in your past behind you. Like being able to say, you know, God, I'm repenting of this, and to actually change your behavior. It's not a call to perfection on either way. But yeah. They do go hand in hand. And one without the other does feel disingenuous. Right. And it's pointless. It's completely pointless. It is just like going through the motions. Your words are a reason. Yeah. yeah. Like, You're like, just like, saying something to end the moment. Yeah. yeah. And so like just acknowledging that you did, yeah, I did something wrong. And it's like, do you actually believe that if you're not mm-hmm. going to change it? Because at that point, it's like in order to have true repentance, it's not just confessing a sin. Like that's not repentance. It's both. That's when it's repentance is like, I'm sorry I did this. And this is the way that I'm going to change it. I am going to walk away from that or I'm going to walk towards you. Mm -hmm. Um, And to shift that perspective in your mind, like you can't just have the idea of like, yeah, sorry, I did that. Yeah. 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 And, and the whole, the, the whole point is, is even thinking about the whole idea of salvation we got ourselves to a place where we got ourselves in trouble. So mm-hmm. Jonah ran away and got himself in trouble, cried out to God to rescue him and save him. And so God's way obviously is the path to life. And so if we fail to if we fail to make that adjustment, that right. switch around, mm-hmm. we're just simply asking God to save us for this moment and to so that we can turn around and walk right back into a, right. a situation where God would have to save yeah. us again which is not a meaningful relationship no. right yeah that's not how that works yeah 
Yeah. So, okay. So we, I mentioned it earlier about about Jonah not not necessarily worshiping idols, but but let's talk just a second about why the failure to worship or why the complacency and and why not doing. I think the the technical term is sin of omission mm-hmm. is is what sure. not doing the things that God calls us to. Um, why is that just as bad as doing something wrong? Right. You know what I mean? I, I have a conviction. I don't know if it's right or wrong, so take this really lightly. But that if you're not, just because you're not participating in idol worship doesn't mean you're, like, in, in a way that's obvious from the nose, doesn't mean you're not making an idol out of something, right. usually myself. So if I'm sure. ever not doing what God asked me to do, it's because I've idolized and been an idol of my own desires, my, the, the things that I want in my own heart, which, as we right. know from the Bible over and over again, probably not a great idea. Like, the desires of our heart lead us into all, right. all kinds of mess. But I'm probably idolizing anything I'm elevating over the will of God or him himself, meaning if I'm neglecting to do what he asked, I'm mm-hmm. elevating even my own free will. Right. I'm making an idol out of that. Like, I don't want to. Right. Yeah. It, that's why it's the same thing. It's just maybe not the same exact thing, just as bad. It's right. like either way, I'm saying no to what God has and right. I'm saying yes to something that I'm now elevating over God right. and I'm being di- disobedient. And that's, in my life experience, the most unsafe place to be. Right. This is, again, the, a wild example of an unsafe place to be. But even in my own life, when I'm elevating my own desires over God, it leaves me open to all kinds of messiness. Absolutely. Where if I'm not, if, when I'm I, you know, making an idol of my own desires, but when I'm actually submitting to God and saying, hey, not, will, not my will, but yours in this situation, yeah. like I'm going to sacrifice what I right. would like and do what you... It might not be fun, but there's a profound safety in that. Yeah. Well, and I would even say that like the idol in your life, whether that be something that's not God or whether it be God, that is the most important thing in your life. Like that Mm -hmm. is the end all be all. You're basing everything off of Mm -hmm. that thing. So like for those of you who are parents, like if you tell your child to do something and they don't do it, they put priority over, they put something priority Mm -hmm. over what you said or what you asked them to do. So they failed to obey And so like yours wasn't the priority. So I think Mm -hmm. we can look the same way in our own lives. Like if we're disobeying God or just avoiding him in general, like that's still putting something about something else is taking priority over him in Mm -hmm. your life. And that is idolatry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the tragedy of that is that, God really is the source of life, and yeah. He really is. Man, yeah. he, he's He's offering and bringing you into something that is so much better than the thing that you're clinging onto. Right. I, the Bible talks about idols all the time as like these dead things that were made in the image of man, like mm-hmm. that they were made by man's hands. They were made in right. the image of man, and so like you get this concept of like. Like you worship something that is futile and and will not give you the very right. thing that you're striving after. It's heartbreaking to get. And the beauty of God and, and the beauty of God in this story here and, and what it says, um, what Jonah says about God, is is profound and phenomenal. And we've mentioned these things already, but the idea and, and this psalm and this prayer lays out so well the idea that God is God is in control of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've already said it. We see it here with he's in control of the sea. He's he, so it, this is the sea was enacting as God's judgment as a way to get Jonah to recognize mm-hmm. he would, God is opposing him, and and as a way to wake him up for the purposes of showing God's mercy and God's salvation. Um, shows that God's sovereign over death, even like nothing more. And we're going to talk about it here in a second the idea that God saves through this idea of of being able to rescue even from death. It's why Jesus uses the this this picture yeah. um, when he describes his resurrection in, in Matthew and in Luke. He talks about the only sign that I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. Well, what's he talking about? Mm. Jonah was dying, dead, and came back to life. It's right. this, the sign of resurrection. Yeah, and so like this is the sign that God gives is that he is he is sovereign over even death itself, yeah. and. So not only is he powerful, but we can trust that his heart is not to judge and not to kill, but right. to rescue, to save, and to give so you good. life. Yeah. So we tend to make heroes out of the biblical characters here, but really the, mm. bi- the the hero is, in this story as it is in our lives, and I feel like we've talked about this a lot lately, but the hero is God. Right. And, and so how does Jonah's story of salvation, how is that really our story of salvation? How's this your yeah. story of salvation? Yeah, I think it's super dangerous. Like as as we do the entire book of Jonah, we'll realize that 
from front to back, he's n- he's never the hero. Like, yeah. yeah, comically, like if you haven't read Jonah, I won't spoil yeah. it. But the, the ending of it is hilarious and wild. Jonah repents, and then he's the grumpiest. He's the biggest jerk in the whole world. The biggest mm-hmm. jerk in the whole world. Yeah. yeah, and it's one of those things where you look at this and it's like you are insufferable. Right. Where you know what I mean? Where it's like, my goodness, are you not the hero of this? Because the point of the story isn't to say, look what humans are capable of. Yeah. The point of the story is to say, look what God can do in your life when you submit to him. Mm-hmm. That even if you, mm-hmm. when a, a city can be saved, he'll save you from the from the grips of death. Like, you know, that that is the power of the story. Yeah. And I think sometimes that um, we like overvalue ourselves in the grand scheme oh, of, yeah. of, the, of, of what God's purpose is yeah. for us. Our purpose is to glorify the name of the Father. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody's plagued with that thought, What's the, what's the, what's my purpose in life? I promise that's it. Right. How that practically plays out, whether you be an accountant or a pastor, I don't know, but I do know that your purpose is to glorify God Yeah. Mm-hmm. and luckily enjoy him forever. That's like the, right. the, the second part of that. That's really awesome that we get to enjoy him as a result. But like the point is to glorify God. So that's why he is the, the, the hero of every narrative, whether right. it be in a, in a biblical sense, whether it be in our own life, because if we're just left to our own devices, then there is no salvation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is no saving work. There is no enjoying God. And there is no glorifying his name. Like right. When his name is glorified, cities are saved. When his right. name is glorified, I'm pulled from the grips of hell. Yeah. When yeah. his name is glorified, my life is better. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole book, a John Piper book called, uh, what's his like fame, big famous? Desiring God. Desiring God. Yeah. The whole point is like Christian hedonism. Like yeah. the sense of like, you hear Christian hedonism and you think like, oh, like ecstasy in the Lord or like feeling, his whole point is in submission and service to God and glorifying right. his name brings us yeah. about the best quality of life possible. So for me, that's the that's the value of not idolizing these people. Think, oh, how heroic. It's like, man, how great and generous is our God working in such imperfect, in, imperfect people. I can have that yeah. too. And that's where I'm going to find the most fulfillment yeah. in my life. And I think that it's cool how the story and how a lot of biblical stories show like what life can look like if you put Jesus and when you put God in the middle of it. Yeah. But like on the flip side, it also shows what does your life look like when God's not in it, mm. when you are worshiping other things, when you are putting other things first, like it's showing you both. And it's so clear that like, God's like, look at what, where you're at. You're literally might as well be dead. Honestly, mm-hmm. in the belly of a fish, you've been running from me. Look at where running from me got you. And then you look at what can my life look like when God is in the center of it? Sorry, yeah. I, I, I was working and laughing. This problem is that why you're laughing right now? Do you yeah. know why I'm laughing? Yeah, belly. No, oh. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> First of all, I made fun of Mary before this podcast started. About she said well, your belly hurts, something like that. I was like, you're gonna, she, uh, she said tummy. She Shut said tummy. Up. That was it. So my tummy hurts. I was like, dude, don't. <laughs> you're gonna don't do say that. that. <laughs> but I was laughing is you keep in the belly of a fish. Do you guys remember the song uh, Big Fish by FFH? Yes. In the belly of a no whale. Way. That's been in my head this whole time. So for you to say that on <laughs> say the nose, like, <gasps> that's all I could think about. It's like, oh, she said the thing. So the moral of this it. podcast is FFH is a very underrated <laughs> CCM band in the 90s. <laughs> Great song. Big Is it Big Fish? Do you remember? I don't remember. I think yeah. there's a song by FFH called Big Fish. Right. Yes. I think that's the title. Go listen right, to In the it. belly of a fish. In the belly of a whale. In Great song. Whale. Great song. But yeah, it, it just shows where your life can be yeah. with God, where your life can be without God. God's right in the center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and what I love about this story is, and, and, and how it plays out in my story is, man, Jonah learns a lesson here. He he responds to, to what God is showing him. God rescues him. Yeah. He responds to it. We're going to find out next week. He, he's going to go to Nineveh now. Yeah. Like, like he's going to change his mind. But he's still going to be grumpy about it. Like, yeah. he's still going to be grumpy. And, and so what it shows is that, hey, just because you get one thing figured out doesn't mean that you're not going to have more lessons yeah. to learn. Doesn't mean that you're going to get it put together because I think there's such this idea that we're going to get saved, God's going to sanctify yeah. us, and we're just going to float above the clouds. Right. And we're, we're not going to have anymore. it all figured out. We have it all figured out. No, our life, Martin Luther, for all his, and we were talking about him before the podcast too. Yes, we talked about FFH tummies and Martin yes, Luther before this, all before this podcast. Yeah. No. Martin Luther said the the life of the believer, this is the first tenet on the 95 Thesis that he na- nails to the doors in, in Wittenberg. He says the, the, the number one tenet of a believer's life is a, that they will leave a life of mm-hmm. repentance. Mm. And, and so like the whole idea that we're going to get to this place one day where we just get it figured out right. and we're going to be the heroes of our story, that it's just not going to happen. Right. Our lives are constantly turning to God, depending on Him for forgiveness, life, and correction. Yeah. Re- Correcting ourselves 
going at it again yeah. and learning something new and, and, and even learning the same thing over and over and right. over again. And God knows that. And God knows that. God knows that. And that's where his like perfect patience comes from too. So like there doesn't have to be that shame and fear every exactly. time we have to turn Super to God. Yeah. He knows. He knows you're never going to figure it out on your own. Yeah. yeah. Phil yeah, Venrick so. had to help me come become comfortable with the fact that I'm yeah. a human being. Yeah. Mm. Because I, I believe that. Like yeah. I believe like God, I'm, God is going to sanctify me to a place where... I'll figure it out. I'll, well, I'll have it figured mm-hmm. out, and I'll be able to to be this. I don't know, you know what I'm no, saying? But, yeah, but this mature sure. believer that right. doesn't struggle, like, and and he helped me navigate this. Like, nah, you're gonna you're gonna. Why did I just say it that way? Nah, nah, nah. nah. No, but I would even encourage you if you're in an environment, or even like whether it be a self made environment that you're telling yourself that or otherwise. Yeah. If you are being inundated with this information that you can somehow outwork your own brokenness, I yeah. promise you're just gonna be bummed. Right. Yeah. You'll be so unsatisfied and so angry. And and even if you know that that's not true, you're still going to be bummed. And you'll give, you'll give up on God because you'll think it doesn't work. Right. Yep, you'll think it doesn't work. You'll think you're never enough. Or even worse, you'll think that he's not enough. Yeah. Right. That's why you're still dealing with this. The reality is like, no, this is so much more nuanced than yeah. that. This yeah. is like a daily, it's a daily conversation, not right. like a, I'll do these five things and then I'm done. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Well, guys, this is great stuff. Any closing thoughts before we wrap up today's podcast? Nope. Michael, if you'd like to drop some bars on Belly of a Fish. In the Belly of a Whale. It's a really good song. Underrated band. F- they, have, they have another good one, too. I don't remember. They had like two hits that I thought were yeah. great. F and yeah. I'm trying to remember them now because that, that was like my heyday. That was yeah. like... It was my wheelhouse. That's when I got saved and when I started listening yeah. to Christian Audio music Adrenaline. and everything. That's a yeah. good one. Maybe we can just do a whole podcast about like 90s trash yeah. and CCM music. That sounds incredible. Yeah. yeah. Burlap to Cashmere. Burlap to Cashmere. Don't, I was. You, was it you, you hate I Burlap don't like Burlap to Cashmere, but they were, they were pretty Such popular Such an L take, Chris. Burlap to Cashmere is so good. They sound Man. a little like a, a tribal, not tribal. No, nah, it's not even tribal. It's it's m- Middle Eastern. No, it reminds me of mariachi music. Mariachi, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so that and and it's not that mariachi music is bad. It's just not my cup of tea. That's fair. So yeah. I yeah. married a, a Hispanic person, so I'm very comfortable with you know Hispanic music, and that's definitely maybe that's why I have such a like hey, an affinity go. to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have you ever heard of Burlap to Cashmere? No. No. Well, there's like a whole underground 90s Christian scene, and that was like probably like one of the cooler yeah. ones. Yeah. That's not what this podcast is. About. It's super yeah. indie. <laughs> super indie. It was yeah. super indie. Yeah, you had to be cool. Like, you, like, you know, people were, oh, uh, Burlap to Cashmere is like almost virtue signal. Like, you're letting people sure. know, like, yeah. Or Enter the Worship Circle. We've talked about that yeah. a lot. If you listen yeah. to Enter the Worship Circle, you're like, oh, you're, you're cool. Like, you know yeah. about the cool worship movement going on. That's right. not like, oh, we wouldn't do this on Sunday morning, but like, this is the real stuff. Right. Yeah. This is the good stuff. This is the good yeah. stuff. Yeah. You don't even know. You don't even know. Yeah. What your church isn't, is. the big yeah. church, corporate church isn't ready for it yet, but like, right. low key, like, we. Which I don't know that we even have that now. When I think about worship, it's pretty much, it's not really gate kept anymore. The cool mm-hmm. stuff. No. Nope. Cool stuff's out there. Cool stuff's out there. You know, it yeah. might not be the most famous right. around doing church, but it's very it's easy to find, I guess. Yeah. So it's a band called Tree Church Music. They make some cool stuff. They're okay. <laughs> yeah. They're I'd okay. call that in, indie worship. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Chris. No, you're very welcome. And yeah, you should listen to Tree Church Music. It is great <laughs> stuff. So, well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, and we, Man, I really hope that this is encouraging to you. I hope that that you find it beneficial and that you're growing in your understanding of these biblical stories and these biblical passages. If you have any questions, there's going to be an email address that's going to show up right here where I'm pointing. But one of these weeks, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to remember to say it so that I can say it correctly. <laughs> but you're going to look at it on the on the video podcast and you're going to find this email address and you're going to email me any questions that you have about the podcast and in a few weeks we are going to be recording a bible question and response uh episode so um you're going to want to get your questions in for that so send those questions in ask and we'll get them on the podcast and uh um otherwise we're going to pick up in Jonah next week we're going to look at Jonah chapter 3 and we're getting close this this short book so It's pretty easy to go through this one. But thank you guys again for being here, and thank you for listening. Have a great week.